Welcome to our February 16th, 2022, Douglas County Board of County Commissioners meeting. Um, occurs to me that I didn't pull up my opening statements. So I'm gonna try to do this from memory. <laughs> Fellow commissioners can jump in if I forget any details. Uh, just a bit of information about how we will run our meetings. Uh, we, there is public comment um, available for every item on our agenda. Um, and there is also general public comment. So towards the beginning of our meeting, we'll take general public comment, which is about things that are not on today's agenda. If you are here to make comment or ask questions related to any of our agenda items, please wait until that topic comes up for discussion where we will host, we will open up for public comment on each of those. Um, we will, when we get to public comment on any of those items, we will hear from folks here in the old courthouse with us first. Um, I've seen multiple people sign up um, from having been here before, which I appreciate. If you're here to make public comment um, and have not signed up, please go ahead and do that. Um, there's a piece of paper that's right up here um, next to the microphone. We will hear from online commenters uh, after hearing from folks in the courthouse. As a reminder to anybody online, um, you will need to use the raise your hand function on Zoom if you wish to be moved into um, in as a panelist so that you can make comment. Um, if you are a presenter joining us online, please uh, plan to keep yourself muted uh, unless presenting or answering questions of the commission. And, um, all of our public comments will be limited to three minutes. Um, this is the important part <laughs> that I almost skipped over. Uh, we'll be limited to three minutes. Um, and Sarah Plinsky in front of um, you at the microphone will give you some reminders of when that time is coming to an end. Uh, the county, please direct all of your comments to the county commission. And uh, the county does reserve the right to mute or remove any speaker for being rude, vulgar, or inappropriate. Um, and with that, I think we can get started on our meeting. So for the consent agenda, um, do fellow commissioners have anything they would like to pull off and have further discussion about? Okay. Is there anybody in the uh, public who would like to pull anything from our consent agenda for further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask if there's anybody online that's raised their hand. Okay, with that, I'll bring it back to the commission for a motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion, but before I do, just wanna call out the um, finding of facts for the conditional use permit for the Eudora Quarry. That was a item that had significant public comment and discussion a couple of weeks ago. So that is on our consent agenda. And with that, I will move to approve our consent agenda items one through eight. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, with that, we will move on to the general public comment um, of our agenda. If you have, actually, could somebody grab the sign-in sheet for me? Sorry, and I can call your, I will call names um, as they're uh, signed up. And just a reminder to please keep your comments to three minutes. Thank you, Joe. Uh, okay, with that, we will start with Brian. Brian, when you get to the microphone, please press the button so that you see the green light and then you can leave it on. Thank you. Still same as last week, Connor, Brian, K, one, two, correction, one, one, two, zero, four, four, six, five, four, eight. Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, retired, 19 June, 1969. Today, I wanna to talk about Wild Bill Contrell and his raid here in the burning of Lawrence in 1863. In 1863, Quantrell and several hundred other violent totalitarian racist Democrats from across the river came here to Lawrence to burn, loot, and murder people. He succeeded in his goals. In fact, his raid on this town and the 200 murders and the burning and looting more or less started and really jumped off and got kicked off good right here where this building stands today. And you may not think it, but Quantrell run. He won even though it took 157 years. Those Democrats came here because the people of Lawrence had the gall to think that they had the right to run their businesses the way they wanted. They thought they controlled the education and raising of their children. They thought they could associate with whoever they wanted, wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and with any number of people they wanted to, AKA peaceably assemble. 
They believed all men were free. They believed they had the right to free speech and freedom of religion. They thought they could seek medical advice if they chose to or not. Their decision from a doctor or a dentist or a veterinarian of their choice and that they could choose to use traditional remedies, scientific palliatives, cures, whatever they wanted to do to treat disease and injury. They thought that, but the collectivist Democrats across the river couldn't have that because it would possibly cause black folks and maybe even some white folks across the river to question the oppressive practices of those Democrats. Practices they enforced at the point of a gun. And in fact, the threat of violence sits right here in the corner today. Why do I say Quantrell run? because today Lawrence is controlled by a small clique of authoritarian collectivist leftist Democrats who think they know better how to run your life than you do, while their own personal lives are almost always invariably dumpster fires. They demand that your small children wear masks at school, even though there's no evidence that small children should do that. And in fact, all the evidence explicitly points in the opposite direction. They demand that you continue to wear masks outside buildings, outside of your home, even though the COVID bell curve since the beginning of January today through today has been exactly the same in this county as it has been in Johnson, Riley, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Leavenworth, and Sedgwick counties. None of them had a mask mandate. Ergo, the mandate here demonstrably had nothing to do with it, and the claim it does is specious at best. Quantrell run, one because the same mentality from he had in those days sits right here today. He won. I'm coming for your seat, Pat. Y'all have a nice day. Amy. My name is Amy and I'm a Douglas County resident. I was very disappointed to hear that after last week's meeting, you three chose to extend the mask mandate unanimously. You, Patrick, just because you wanted to present yourself as being on the same page as them. Sorry, I didn't realize we had elected a follower. You should definitely be making decisions about all of us because they are in our best interest. I just wanna know what the heck is going on. We are almost the only place left in the country with a mask mandate. Just call us little New York City. Oh wait, they're doing away with theirs too. It's your fault these officers have to put up with mad citizens. It's quite frankly at this point an abuse of power. You don't like how mad we are and the things we say, so you continue to extend it. Oh wait, are you getting money? It would be just like politicians to pocket money and abuse their power. This country has gotten out of control in that aspect. I hope and pray that all of these politicians who are doing wrong for money and power pay the consequences. Especially Hillary Clinton for this fake dossier. There was no Russia collusion with our wonderful 45th president. You can stop calling that a conspiracy theory, by the way. There are lots of things you can stop saying that about actually. Fauci is a fraud and a liar. Did you hear about the emails? where he admits this virus was made in a lab, which is something they tried to hide. I can't wait for all this crap to unravel. We have a message on the corner by the USD 497 building, lots of them actually, but the main one is stop forcing our children to wear masks. Let's go, Brandon. I apologize, I'm not quite sure what this name is. Lena, sorry about that. Okay. okay. My name is Lena. I'm a Douglas County resident. I am also in the USD 497 school district. I was really disappointed that you guys continued the mask mandate for three more weeks, considering other counties, cities, even states have pretty much dropped it. What you do dictates what our school district may do. The younger kids are really going to be affected by this as they need to see the mouth move to learn how to talk. There are several problems with forcing us to wear masks. Some of us have a hard time breathing. It causes anxiety. It causes rashes. and makes it hard to read facial expressions, just to name a few. Furthermore, we have spectacular immune systems designed by nature. The majority of us have already had COVID and we have natural immunity built up. 
It is no big secret that there is very helpful and important information being censored while the TV and radio will have you believing everyone is so much worse off. It's called fear mongering. The lies need to stop and we need to live free. Wear a mask if you want, don't if you don't. It should be our choice. Thank you, Lena. <clears throat> Anna? Hello. I'm going to reinstate a lot of things that were said already. I was also disappointed last week that the mask mandate was extended again. Um, and because of that, I'm going to serve you three and the sheriff. Can I hand that to you? And in those um, affidavits, you will see that one of the things that is mentioned that the mandates breaks and falls away from is the Kansas Bill of Rights. And you've heard it all before. All men are possessed of equal and inalienable natural rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the mandates create this like chasm in our society. And it's between the people who enforce the mandate and who follow the mandate and those people who don't enforce it and who don't want to follow it. But to have people being treated differently in our society in Douglas County is wrong, just based on medical choices. Uh, we're all equal where we were all made by God and it shouldn't matter what our medical decisions are or our race shouldn't matter. You know, all these things, we know what has happened in history if people are created Create, uh, treated differently. If you treat someone as w like worse than you, or you, there are people that are better, we know what happens when we do this to each other. <clears throat> and what I think is an outrage is in Lawrence, this is happening. So we have the mask mandates, but we also have places where you can't get in without the vaccine to mention like the Art Center, Henry's, Liberty Hall, Limestone Pizza. It is a disgrace that this has been allowed to happen in our community. Even more so since there is, we know there's not 100% proof that masks or vaccines work. Within my own family now, there, everyone has gotten COVID, no matter if they were vaccinated or not. The person who had the most vaccines, like all of them with the boosters, he got COVID the worst. And therefore, there, there's no guarantees that we won't get COVID. Um, therefore, and we should not like make these divisions and treat people differently about their choice, especially since it doesn't seem to matter. But even if it would, let's say it was 100% certain, even then, we should not. A lot of these things are based on fear, a lot of these decisions. And I understand that people are afraid of getting COVID because it just is so different, but let's fight for freedom. Nora. Hi, my name is Nora Murphy and I'm from Lawrence. Um, I'm currently working with the City of Lawrence Parks and Recreation Department and the Watkins Museum of History and a group of legacy family members um, from La Yarda. And we have a plan to petition BNSF Railway uh, to transfer some property, the La Yarda property, um, to um, the city. And, and what we'd like to do is when we petition BNSF, we'd like to enclose letters of support from various community groups like the, the county commission. Um, for those that don't know, La Yarda is a site in East Lawrence, just east of the railroad tracks at 8th and Delaware. It's a settlement established by the railroad where in the early 20th century, Mexican railroad workers lived with their families. And the site has become an important um, touch, touchstone for um, many people whose 
who trace their family origins to that site. So the idea behind all this is to um, preserve this historic site and engage the public more completely with um, its story. Um, and with Parks and Recreation, they would envision a, a little tiny park and have the, park, the Watkins Museum would um, help create kiosks and um, you know hands-on kinds of things for education for people. Um, so including possibly um, one unit of housing that would sort of represent what it looked like back in the day. So along with our uh, petition to BNSF asking for permission to use or own this property site, we would like to include letters of support. And um, so I just thought I'd bring it up tonight and um, maybe follow up with a letter or to whom I, I'm not sure to whom I should send the letter to you. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. Yes, you can send it. Sarah Plinsky is our county administrator and um, she be, she'll give you a card and um, you can stay in touch with her. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Sue? Hi. My name is Sue Herrink. I live here in Lawrence. I want to talk to you tonight about the fact that we are living in madness. It's characterized by masks on faces, even on two-year-old children, censorship, forced med medication, the vax, vax IDs just for starters. I want to take a break from that madness tonight and talk to you for a moment and focus on love. A wise person once said something that I read about and it stuck. She said, be the love that you are. That means every day. And that brings me to ask where the love is being manifested in Douglas County and where it is not. The not part is easy. We're in its midst in this meeting. Here children are not loved. They are lost to this county commission's greed. Love is being manifested by a group of protesters on the corner of the administration building of USD 497. We protesters are standing out of love for children, their well being, and liberty, while blindness for the well being of children continues here in Douglas County. We are doing it to the, our best to be the love that we are every day, especially around 3 30 to 6 o'clock. This has been going on for six months and we will not stop until the draconian masking of children stops. We stand for the voiceless. We are organized, we are spontaneous and open to all. It is not always easy being there. Standing away from the crowd never is, but it is the right thing to do. The responses we receive are around 85% positive and rising as we make our stand. We are passionate, sometimes offensive, always unapologetic and unrelenting in voicing our love for children and liberty. All of you here tonight, be the love that you are and stop the madness. You could do it right now. You could turn this mask mandate on its ear you could unmask the kids in Douglas County. Free our children. Justin. <clears throat> Justin, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Justin Spies. Um, my PhD is in lifespan human development from Kansas State University. Some of you might not know what that means, Basically, it means that uh, I know about normal and abnormal human development. And uh, I can tell right now, and I've been saying it for a long time, what you guys are doing to kids is uh, really messing them up. It's child abuse. <clears throat> That's what I want to talk about tonight. This past Monday, I went to a, or uh, can't, I attended a school board meeting via Zoom. I can't go on school property anymore because I got 
permanently banned for not wearing a mask. I'm not able to wear a mask. But none of these people care. <clears throat> none of them care. And so I'm, I'm online talking, and I happen to mention that uh, the superintendent, Dr. Anthony Lewis, makes $236,530 a year and just got a $10,000 raise last month by the school board. And this guy here, Patrick Kelly, who's an administrator there, makes $109,938 uh, a year. And uh, I got muted repeatedly while I was doing that. And then just, you know, kicked out of the, kicked out. I wasn't able to finish speaking um, because I wasn't able to talk about administrators or students. But prior to that, the first person that spoke called Superintendent Anthony Lewis divine. Just straight up called him divine, sent from God. Another person got up there and had a recording of students talking. So they could talk about administrators and they could talk, are you, list, are you even listening? And they can talk about students, no problem. But the second I start saying something, it's a problem because they don't like the words coming out of my mouth. And the words coming out of my mouth are the truth. And I know a lot of you people don't care uh, if I got censored or kicked out. There's probably funny to, to a lot of you people. And that's fine with me. I don't really care about that. The problem is, is that the opinion I have now and the words that I'm saying now, they have a problem with. At some point in the future, you might have an opinion and you might have words that the powers that be don't like, and then you get censored, and then it's not so funny. That's why I'm standing up for this stuff, because once we start doing this, there's no stopping it. When you voice your opinion that goes against the crowd, you will be othered. You will be kicked out. That student there at Lawrence College and Career Center, the principal is Dr. DeWitt, <clears throat> told him, I can't wear a mask. And I have a video recording. I sent it to each one of you three. And I sent it to you, Arm uh, Sheriff Armbrister back there, of the student saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, right, guys? I can't breathe. And the, stu and the staff member says, uh-uh. This is a quote. There are studies after studies after studies that say that masks do not interfere with breathing or asthma. Now, I'm going to use your lefty language. Her lived experience was that she couldn't breathe. It doesn't matter if there's study after study after study. She couldn't breathe. Why is that not child abuse? I emailed each one of you and the video. Armbrister, why isn't that child abuse? You're more worried about me wearing a mask in here than stopping child abuse. Shame on every single Your time one is of you. up, Justin. Joe. My name is Joe Herrick, and I'm living here in Lawrence. Declaration of Independence, and I quote the second paragraph. Second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And in the quote, uh, to paraphrase a little bit further, uh, we the people have a right and an obligation to replace a corrupt government. And that's what we're trying to do is re dress our grievances. Nobody listens. Marbury versus Madison, 1803, a Supreme Court ruling that many scholars say is the most important that's ever come out of the Supreme Court. The main points are federal laws that conflict with the U.S. Constitution are invalid. The second point is judges determine whether federal laws are unconstitutional, and this is called judicial review. Mandates are not laws. They're agreements between parties. And if they can pull in a federal law, and they can pull in a mandate that's unconstitutional, it's not even a law. Thomas Jefferson, there is no justification for taking away individuals' freedom in the guise of public safety. 
when the rest when the rest of the world after two years is sprinting towards the finish line douglas county is still in the starting blocks right what we have here is a box with a federal or a uh, surgical mask it's made in the usa for the usa it's four layers let's read the warning mass does not eliminate risk of user contracting infectious or disease mass is not to be used in the presence of extreme heat or flammable gas face masks are not intended to provide protection against pathogenic biological airborne particulates and are not recommended for use in aerosol rich procedures or conditions with significant Joe, risk time of up. infection through insulation. In other words, they are totally worthless. Susan? During the Constitution Convention, there was a wise leader named Benjamin Franklin who found that the people there were not having a good time. They were arguing, they were not coming to consensus. He decided that it was most important that they bring God back into the procedure. And I'm gonna do that tonight because I don't know where else to go with you guys. Can you bow your head in prayer, please? Dear Lord Jesus, we ask that you bless and keep these public servants in your arms tonight as they endeavor to do the work of serving the citizens of Douglas, Douglas County. Allow knowledge and wisdom that you gave to them be upon their hearts and minds tonight. Amen. Okay, now for my speech. Good evening. Once again, I stand here before you asking you to vote to rescind the mask mandate. Your job as county government is to educate, communicate, not mandate. When you finally trust, and will, when will you finally trust in individuals to make the best decisions for themselves? The mask mandate as it stands has no enforcement. Go to any Douglas County restaurant and you will see an entire dining room sitting, eating and chatting without masks on. Somehow the virus knows not to infect these seated individuals. However, they stand up and whoa, Nelly, you better have your mask on. Removing the mask mandate will not take away an individual's choice to mask if they so choose. Neither will it affect parents who wish to mask their children at school. It will simply allow Douglas County to be in line with every other county in Kansas by not requiring masks to go about daily business. Once again, I remind you that there is a vaccine available to anyone five and older who wishes to get it. The federal government has made tests free to anyone who requests them. So why are you discussing spending $264,000 to buy tests for the county? You just write to the government, they'll send you one. Finally, I'd like to share with you that unless you're entering this building on a Wednesday night, when you must run the gauntlet of sheriff's deputies, making sure you have a face covering, there is no one enforcing this mandate. In fact, when I visited your offices last Friday, even Robin Crabtree was at her desk unmasked. It reminds me of the Super Bowl rules for thee, but not for me. You as commissioners have, have, your, have had your boot on the neck of the citizens of Douglas County for long enough. Give it up. It probably already is too late for your reelections. Thank you. Bonnie. Good evening to the county commissioners and county administrator Polinsky. Thank you for your service. You are doing a great job. And while people disagree with you, your hearts are in the right place and you're doing the right thing. And we appreciate that. I'm Bonnie Lowe, the president and CEO of the Lawrence Chamber of Commerce, and I sympathize with your position. 
As a business advocate, we do respectfully ask that you reconsider the mask mandate based on data points that will work with LMH and other uh, health officials. We look forward to continuing the work to achieve our common goals, our collective public health, and the health of our community's economy. Thank you for the thankless job that you're doing. We do appreciate your work and we stand beside you and wish you'd reconsider the mask mandate and we're here to be a partner to you. Thanks for your service. Thank you, Bonnie. Is there anybody else, <clears throat> excuse me, that did not sign up but is present and would like to provide public comment? Um, as a reminder, uh, for those that are not currently wearing a face covering, I ask that you please wear a face covering if you wish to stay for the rest of our meeting. Thank you. Um, is there anybody online that's got public comment? Jill, I'll turn it over to you. Our first public speaker, um, all I can see is Lawrence DSA. Um, I'm going to move this person over into the panel and you can unmute and offer your public comment. Lawrence DSA, you can go ahead and unmute. Go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is uh, Kirby Evers with the uh, local DSA. Um, not one of us here can say COVID has not taken uh, its toll upon us, whether by sickness, uh, the death of a family member, or the restrictions we see and feel each day. Yet we push on not because we are afraid, but because we know the consequences of doing, or doing nothing is to overwhelm the sensitive ecosystem of our local hospitals. We at the Democratic Socialists of America are critical like many of the moneyed interests present in our medical system. However, this does not mean we can afford to disregard the overwhelming scientific consensus. That made clear, we only ask that these troubling times, um, in these troubling times, we do not land the burden of these responsibilities solely upon the working class. We as do many in our community, believe that this council has done their best with their limited resources to protect their fellow neighbors to this end. But what have they gotten in return? Nothing less than unwarranted slander, unfounded legal actions, and thinly veiled death threats. Um, these ignorant and panicked anti-mask protesters have served this council nothing but cherry-picked articles, outright lies, Nazi salutes, and um, deranged conspiracy theories. Yet, they wish to be taken seriously when they give nothing as a compromise. Every attempt to compromise is used as a tool to further target what small measures have been put in place to combat the recent outbreaks. <sighs> and they have said it before, let nature stop take its- interrupting. Sorry, Lawrence DSA, we have somebody, oh, we missed a little bit of what you said. Please do not speak over <laughs> other commenters. And they have said it before, let nature take its course. That is to say, let the elderly die. Let the immune compromised die. Let the most vulnerable among us die. All for the pure and noble call to freedom to protect them from the tyrannical minor inconveniences of wearing almost any face covering in a crowded indoor venue. We at the DSA applaud this uh, commission's effort to protect everyone, not few, not the majority, but all. Thank you, all of you, and have a good day. We thank don't you. have any more public comment thank online. You. No other public comment. Okay, thank you. With that, <clears throat> we will close general public comment and move on to our regular business agenda. Okay, it looks like item, uh, our first item on the regular agenda is about the establishment of a civilian-based coroner scene investigation unit, Sarah. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I, I'm really pleased to bring forward this item today and I'm uh, Sheriff Jay Armbrister is gonna join us at the podium. We've got a couple of members of our team that have been working on this here as well. I wanna go back and provide just a little bit of background on uh, the county's engagement with coroners and coroner scene work just to provide some context for, for what we've got in front of us tonight. The county by state statute is responsible for naming a county coroner. Um, the county coroner is responsible for medical exams and autopsies. 
uh, we, the county has been contracted with Frontier Forensics for a significant period of time to provide those coroner services for us. This proposal here for you tonight is to discuss coroner scene and field, field investigations. This is slightly different work. They do work as an extension of the coroner, but our scene team is required to attend all unattended deaths in Douglas County. So in some cases, they attend an unattended death. Um, most of these do not involve law enforcement. Most of our unattended deaths, and there's been approximately about 240 or so last year in Douglas County, um, that uh, our, the county has, has financed the operation of these scene folks uh, to, to attend and serve at the, as an extension of the coroner. Frontier Forensics is located out of Kansas City, Kansas. Um, and our scene investigation work has been local for a significant period of time. Um, rough, I, I would say that I, I don't have the, I think the exact numbers are in the outline, but uh, the county is contracted with Lawrence Douglas County Fire Medical to provide this service for a couple decades. <laughs> in the last, uh, in the evaluation of the uh, service agreement and the governance agreement with the city of Lawrence on the Lawrence Douglas County Fire Medical, this was one of the issues that was raised um, and the commission agreed to a new agreement last April. As a part of that, there was conversation about coroner service work. At that time, Lawrence Douglas County Fire Medical expressed that they no longer wish to provide the service. Um, we talked about a variety of different, could we, could we provide it a different way? Could it be staffed a different way? Could additional funds be provided? And, and really as a part of that discussion, LDCFM was, was not interested in providing the service any longer. So when that agreement was signed as the administrator who I have um, I, with my team, I, I wanna acknowledge Julie Sackreiter here, our management information analyst who's worked on this project and manages um, our relationship with the coroner we were tasked to really come up with what options could be considered. Uh, we did, we talked to Frontier Forensics, we talked to our law enforcement professionals, we talked to our district attorney, we talked to a number of folks and to try to determine what the best option would be moving forward. Uh, this work team, and we outlined who's on that work team is included in your packet. The work team uh, approached the sheriff and asked him to consider um, support supporting a division in his operations for coroner scene investigation. Um, you know, really when we looked through this, when we got the proposal from Frontier Forensics, um, it, was, it was substantially expensive um, and they would not be locally based. Um, and the way their agreement would be structured is it could take three hours for them to respond. Now, I, I think Frontier Forensics is doing the best they can and, and want it is a great partner for us for coroner work, but when we were evaluating those options, it really became, um, there's a strong recommendation of all of the law enforcement partners that we have someone closer and locally based to provide those services. So with that, um, I, I, Julie and I contacted uh, former director of this program with Lawrence Douglas County Fire Medical, Ed Noonan, who's here with us. And he provided an extensive amount of expertise as we began the development of the program. Um, let's see, the overview, basically what we're recommending is that we hire two full-time staff people that work Monday through Friday um, to support the program. In addition to that, we will hire on-call staff that will cover uh, the rest of the time uh, needed for the service. Um, they will work as a civilian division underneath the sheriff's office. Just important to note that this, this has always been civilian work. And when it was LDCFM, it was civilian. Uh, but we wanted to clarify the sheriff has a number of employees that are sworn and unsworn. This would be an unsworn division. Um, and uh, we would set aside a budget to provide for the, op for the staffing cost for it and the equipment needed to provide the service. We anticipated this transition. There are funds set aside in the 2022 budget to begin the implementation of this program. I do wanna really thank our partners with Lawrence Douglas County Fire Medical who have been helpful and vital in this process as we've examined our options and have agreed to continue in a transition arrangement while we get staff on, ensuring that they're trained and ensuring that we have practices in place. So I know there are representatives from um, LDCFM available online if, if we have questions for them specifically, and they have been super 
uh, helpful in the establishment of this program and how we will work together to implement uh, the strategies moving forward and a transition plan. With that brief overview, I just invite Sheriff uh, Armbruster to say anything he'd like to say, and, and we all stand for questions as, uh, as to how the program would be structured. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so I think, it, I think it deserves a little clarification and a little bit of history as to what this actually is. I think um, <clears throat> the, the corner scene investigator is basically like, I'm the sheriff, but all the other, these other folks you see in uniform are my deputy. They do the work for me. The course, we have a coroner who is in Kansas City, and then he basically deputizes these civilians to do his work for him on these scenes. Having worked side by side with these scene investigators for most of my career, um, you know, Ed and I <laughs> have worked together on many scenes and, and all of the other investigators. What I always loved about it was that they were First off, they were paramedics typically or firefighters and they had more of a, they had a different background than I did from a criminal investigation and they had more of a medical uh, expertise than I did. They ran their investigation independently, but alongside what we were doing. We would share notes, we would talk to each other about the things we had seen, heard and learned, but they conducted their, uh, their uh, independent investigation with their own priorities and we had conducted ours. And then once the coroner got the case, if they had questions about what the coroner scene investigators had or had not found, they would come to us for clarification and we would work it all out. When this was brought to me, <clears throat> my immediate thought was, I want this to remain an autonomous and independent group from any criminal investigation. The work that they do is to basically provide a perspective that we do not have or just not trained in. So, I know that there has been, uh, there could be a, people could draw a, a, a line saying that this could be a conflict of interest. And I'm aware of that. And I don't disagree that on its face, it could be. However, the way we are structuring this out of the gate is to make sure that this is autonomous, independent, and separate from any criminal investigation. These folks will have their own offices. They will have their own equipment. They will do their own thing for lack of a better term. And we don't want the county to see uh, a drop in any way, shape or form of the services that they currently receive. Um, I also want to address the local portion of it in that again, Frontier Forensics has a very difficult job. They are in Kansas City. They have contracts with many big agencies up there. And if we need them to respond, <clears throat> we cannot, as a, as a street officer, as an investigator, we cannot allow the time to pass when someone's loved one is deceased in their home, in the hospital bed, uh, in wherever it may be, to just lay there until we wait for them to come. And uh, that's, that's not good for anybody. <laughs> and we want, as the sheriff's office, we want to help expedite that and get that process started quicker and handed more, uh, handled thoroughly as, as we can, as quickly as we can. So there is a human aspect, but there's also uh, a logistical aspect that we feel like this is the right answer. Uh, I have a thousand other things I would be glad to say about it, but I will just shut up right now. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to field them and shed light in any way, shape or form that would help with this process. Because it, it's a lot of technical jargon, jargon and TV is not always accurate. We are not, when we say CSI, it's coroner scene investigator. It's not crime scene investigator. It's, there's just a lot of differences, but I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. So I feel, feel free to ask any questions that you'd like. Ms. Commissioner Reed, thank you, Sheriff Armbruster and Sarah for that background and overview. Um, I think it might be helpful um, for us to, define some of those things a bit more um, for the community. So I think the context and the history is really important. I think it would be helpful to talk about um, what an unattended death is and just be a little bit more specific about some examples of that. Uh, <laughs> and then one other thing I would add is, um, can you um, kind of help flush out a little bit more the the difference in those roles at a crime. So if there is an unattended death mm -hmm. where there is also a criminal investigation right. process wise, 
how is that scene secured how like what is the what is the step by step look like okay. um and yeah we'll just start there very good so again i'm a, i'm law enforcement so i'm not educated in the ways of medical uh, thinking in words, but my understanding of the term unattended death is not simply that a person was not, was, was alone. It was not unattended. It's the fact that they did not have an attending physician. So if I have, a, I have a doctor and the doctor knows that I've had congestive heart failure for 25 years and I wake up dead one day in my bed, that the police would show up, the corner scene investigator could show up, and they could call my doctor and the doctor says, I know all about this. I'm going to be attending. I will sign off on this death certificate, making it an attended death. And then the CSI in the criminal investigation would just be abbreviated, so to speak. That's, <clears throat> that's a small percentage of the way it usually works. I mean, there's quite a few, but I think what the people really want to talk about are unattended deaths where a criminal case does occur. So uh, we would have, we have just from the sheriff's office. Now, first off, I also wanna point out that our agency or this agency would be responsible for all deaths that occur inside the Douglas County. That means in the city of Eudora, city of Baldwin, city of LeCompton and the city of Lawrence, which would be the lion's share of these cases. So they would not always, if not, I mean, a small percentage of them would be sheriff's office cases. They would be Lawrence Police Department cases where the Douglas County CSI would be uh, handling the, the CSI portion of it. And <clears throat> we have, obviously, we've been doing this system for a long time, so there are protocols already set up as far as scenes and that kind of stuff. But what I can tell you from, from my experience is that um, uh, once, once an, a, a, a death occurs, we don't, it's not up to us to decide if it's unattended or not. We treat them all the same. And once we get there, we immediately call for the CSI. The, and at this point, we would contact <clears throat> LDCFM. They would find their on-call person, send them to us. And those two, the investigator and that CSI, would then begin working simultaneously, side by side, independently, <laughs> to work through the scene, work through all of the uh, follow-up, and then work through uh, their paperwork and anything else that needs to happen. Again, independently, they can ask each other questions, but they do their own thing. So there would be no change in the protocols as far as that goes. Uh, we would simply be wearing a different shirt. <laughs> I suppose the CSI would show up wearing a different shirt, driving a different car. So I hope that I catch yep, any of that. <laughs> helps. I'm just going to add on to it a little bit. So that uh, kind of working side by side, which mm -hmm. is how I envisioned it might occur but independently you mentioned they can ask each other questions they're sort of assessing the whole situation mm -hmm. at the same time but with their own list of questions and objectives for what they're trying to seek so the documentation that they would each be um, creating remains separate right that's it, the it would be similar but it would definitely be separate they take their own photos they take their own measurements uh, we do all the same things uh, when it comes to the actual collection of evidence and that kind of stuff. Obviously, that, that would be the sheriff's office or that would be the law enforcement agency. But no, they, they do all of their own things. And, and again, Ed could talk more to the specifics of what the CSI does on scene. Uh, but a lot of it is similar, but completely separate. Okay, thank you. Questions from fellow commissioners? Okay. <laughs> Jay, is is there other communities that use this same model or are we unique in this model? In, in our research, you know, we really found that there isn't a consistent best practice as to how to approach this work. Um, it really depends on the coroner and how, you know, if your community has a coroner on site and how that work is handled. Um, and in some case, and it also, there's also a conversation about how many deaths happen in a year that would require this service right. so in our research you know particularly in the midwest in kansas we did not find a, a consistent best practice or approach um, it really varies based off of what right. the community's specific concerns and needs are what she said 
I do have one more question, uh, as Commissioner Reed again. Can you talk a little bit about the um, piece of the proposal that speaks to um, the regular meetings of stakeholders mm -hmm. um, to discuss how those investigations and processes are going, which I understand to be something that's been in place mm -hmm. and longstanding. So can you just talk a little bit about why that's an important piece of it and any specific transition that you see being a part of that or is it just um, continuing on as it has been but with a different person at the table? So you're, you're, you're absolutely right. These meetings have been going on. They're monthly. Uh, they're, I don't know, on a Friday, like 5.30 in the morning or something crazy early. I just <laughs> was not good at going to them. <laughs> but uh, I would see no, no difference in how that operates. The importance of those is, uh, number one is to get all of your investigators together to go through all of, I mean, and law enforcement comes too, but uh, we always did it at the LDCFM and the CSI investigators sat at the table, police and everybody else sat at back and we watched and listened. If they had questions, we would answer. But they would, they would basically uh, peer review each other's work, uh, ask questions, point things out that maybe somebody hadn't seen or heard. Um, and it was, it was a way for them to really make sure that they were doing everything consistently and doing it right. Um, it is very morbid and traumatic work and sitting through those is very, very difficult. Um, but uh, they, the, the, I can't tell you how helpful they are when it comes to having another perspective or another set of eyes looking at something that you've gone over a thousand times. That's helpful, thanks. I, um, learning that that has been in place um, was uh, really great to hear. I was unaware of that actually. I, mean, you know, I was sort of aware functionally of how LDCFM and Frontier Forensics and law enforcement work together, but I didn't know about those meetings. And so I'm, I'm glad to know that that's been in place in our community. And I think that um, it does seem to provide a really important opportunity for getting those varied perspectives um, and sharing necessary information while still being able to yep. remain independent with certain yep. pieces of it. Um, if I could add something to that, I, I do wanna take this opportunity to really acknowledge the work that these folks do in our community. This is really hard, difficult work. Um, you're meeting people at a very difficult time. And, and I really, I, I have in my 11 years here, have been really impressed with the team of folks that have been doing this work for our community. They are thoughtful, they're careful, they're detail oriented, they're empathetic. Um, they're highly trained professionals. We tr the county supports their training um, mm -hmm. so that they are qualified to do this work and they really meet people in a very difficult time. So this, isn't, this is not work for everyone. I do anticipate we will have recruitment challenges mm -hmm. for this work. Um, we've been working already to try to begin that process of trying to identify individuals that will want to be a part of this effort moving forward. And um, I really just want to take a chance, take a moment to really um, acknowledge that and really thank them for their service to our community. And to add on to that, this was not something that I, as the sheriff or the sheriff's office, wanted. Um, this is uh, th this is a no win, no happy ending position. These CSI investigators only get called on the worst day of somebody's life, of, of a family's life. And like I've told some folks is that, not to be graphic, but these folks will respond every day to deceased persons in various states of decomposition of all ages. And I don't think I need to explain how difficult that can be so <clears throat> this is not something, this is a, a necessary evil within our system, which I want to be sure is handled correctly and, uh, and done as diligently and as with as much empathy and compassion as we can possibly afford. And I think that that's uh, another good reason why I wanted it under the sheriff's office umbrella. Thank you. Ms. Commissioner Reed, last call for questions from commissioners. Okay, I'll go ahead and open this up for public comment. If there's anybody here with us in person that would like to make comment, you may come up to the microphone and do so. Brian, I see your hand, go ahead.
Brian Connor, you know who I am. All right, Sheriff, a couple quick things I'd like to make comment wise for you from looking at your PDF. One is, I don't have real significant details, so I may be crazy, but uh, I assume you want new work vans and you're looking to budget 40 grand per van, uh, given today's environment where new vehicles are almost impossible to get your hands on and people are paying significant pre you know, premiums for that. I don't know if that's gonna be 100% accurate, food for thought. Another thing is, is we're turning, uh, contracted individuals, either from other government agencies or from an actual civilian contractor, private business, and we're replacing them with uh, employees of some sort of government agency here in the county. I don't know if we've looked at potential uh, pension liabilities and all those kind of things going forward. That would be somebody else's problem if they work for this uh, civilian company we've been contracting with in the past. Uh, the school has no money. Uh, as far as I know, the county has money problems elsewhere. Do we want to pour gasoline on that dumpster fire? I don't know. Food for thought. Um, another thing, food for thought wise, uh, we, the, 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 the sheriff's PDF or whoever's PDF it was I was looking at says that there's something like 300 potential cases a year or something like that. Uh, I suspect in the last couple of years, a significant number of those have been driven by the coronavirus. Uh, I suspect prior to that, a significant number were driven by another infectious issue of some sort, whether that was the flu or whatever. Uh, and we have some potential concerns discussed about separation between the sheriff and the coroner's investigation scene unit or whatever the CSI stands for. I don't know, perhaps the Department of Public Health is a better location for this. I don't know, food for thought, something I'm thinking of as I sit here in the corner. Uh, but just the things I wanted to throw out. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention to the sheriff and to the deputies. Um, Y'all are not the arbitrator of whether or not a comment by another speaker is directed at me. Um, the arbitrator of that is these folks here. So Please keep your comments to the that, agenda item. Yeah, that's the only thing I have to say. So that's what I have to say about these comments. And uh, I got comments maybe on the next thing too. Thanks. Anybody else here for that wishes to make public comment? Is there anybody online, Jill, that's raised their hand? Thank you. Sheriff Armbruster, would you like to respond in any way? I can or respond to all of them if you would like, but I nope. think it's I I think it's not I think I've said what I need to say. Great. Okay, we'll bring this back to discussion amongst the commissioners. Um <clears throat> I will just say that I think that given the context and the history of how we got from point A to point B, and especially in light of learning that there um, is not truly a best practice and that there's a lot of different models for how communities handle coroner scene investigations and oblige that statutory requirement that we have as a county. Um, so I, I feel like this is a really good solution given all of that. Um, I'm particularly appreciative of the of localizing it. Um, and I think that's an important value to me. Um, I think that for some of the logistical reasons that were mentioned by Sheriff Armbruster, um, for the quickness of response um, and the, the relationships um, that are likely to be built and would exist amongst those stakeholders and um, community partners is, uh, much more feasible with local based um, corner scene investigators. And I think that, um, well, I just appreciate that the sheriff's office is willing to um, take this on and create space for this role because it is kind of, it's a pretty unique role. It's not a big department because we aren't a huge county. We're kind of in this, we've talked about this in lots of different spaces um, in, of county work that um, in the in terms of the whole state, we're in this kind of weird spot where we're not a small county, um, but we're not one of the biggest counties. Um, and sometimes those population numbers and the numbers of unattended deaths in this example um, can make it a little tricky to see a clear path to um, how we best staff those services. Um, so I do, I think this is a good solution. Since I know folks from LDCFM are um, here, I, I don't have any questions for you all, but I just appreciate that this has been a longstanding service 
they've provided to our community um, and had to sustain that even with um, perhaps some pretty escalated um, growth in those numbers annually um, while battling other challenges and struggles in our community, particularly in the last couple of years. So um, I, I am in favor of moving forward with this and think that it is a um, good solution to the problem that, is that we're presented with. This is Commissioner Portillo. I agree with all of that, in particular, the focus on localizing this. And I thank Sheriff Armbister for taking this on. I know that this is an area of public service that's incredibly important and something that is difficult for us to manage and work through. And I, I do appreciate that we're actually bringing this in-house rather than you know, relying on contracting out, because I think it's important for us to have the capacity to serve our community. So I appreciate that we're going to develop this for the county and serve the county in this way. Um, so I just, and if you don't have other comments, I'm happy to. I would just say, I, I appreciate the problem solving that, that took place because I know this is something that has been emerging over the past couple of years with LDCFM not wanting to continue with the current situation. And, um, as someone who uh, recently had a family member that needed corner services, having them close. Um, and I really appreciate uh, Sheriff Armbrister talking about the compassion that needs to be for those family members who are waiting for that to happen so they can start the next step of the process. That's a very fragile time. And having someone who can be there quickly or is on call and is not um, stretched as thin as, as um, our contracted services have been in the past is um, really in my mind, thoughtful good government because when people are needing people that to take care of some of the nasty work that has to be done, um, being understanding that, that doing it quickly and doing it effectively um, is, is the best thing. So I appreciate you recognizing that and, and coming up with a solution that um, that, that focuses on that. So thank you. Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion. This is Commissioner Bortillo. I move to authorize the Sheriff's Department to proceed with the establishment of a civilian-based coroner scene investigation unit. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Armstrong. Um, okay, item 3.2, um, we've got a presentation about our health insurance plan design. Thank you, Commissioners. Ms. Elspear, our HR Director, is going to come up and give us a presentation on possible plan design changes for our employee health care program. Michelle? Good evening. Okay, uh, let's my notes organized here. Um, so before I get into kind of the, the meat of what we want to talk about, I just thought I'd recap quickly um, how we ended last plan year just to kind of see where we're at. Um, our total plan cost came in 12% below uh, projected, um, which is that's a great thing. We added about $1.3 million to the, the fund balance. The year before that, uh, we came in 9% below. So we've had a couple of really good plan years. Um, we do think that some of that is, uh, you know, delayed care due to COVID. Um, so we could quickly rebound that $2.3 million um, with the cost of health care. So it's not something you want to hang your hat on, but, but it has been a couple of good years. Um, our medical claims are running about what they were this time last year. Um, so we could have, you know, another good year um, since we're, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so far, we've reported about $100,000 in COVID related expenses on our plan. That will, that number will probably triple at least. Um, we've had some pretty high claims uh, for some COVID expenses these last uh, few months. So we'll get some updated numbers on those. Our stop loss premiums, when we renewed um, 6 1 of 2020, um, we did get a large increase in stop loss. Um, we had some, some pretty high stop loss claims in the previous year, and the, actually, the, the 
years before that. So we expected a, a um, you know, a decent increase. Willis does a really, Willis is our uh, broker, our consultant. They do a pretty good job of negotiating on our behalf. Um, they reduce their commissions um, to keep us within our budget parameters. Um, so we had, we paid about $1.3 million in stop loss premiums last plan year and had a reimbursement of uh, about 558,000. So they definitely made money off of us, the, the stop loss company did, um, but some good news, we did not have an increase in stop loss premiums in the current plan year we're in. So that was, that was nice. Um, we did have three claimants hit our stop loss limit of $195,000. So, and I think I've talked about it before, but stop loss, if once an individual claimant reaches $195,000 in claims, that's where the, the county's liability ends for that claim. And then um, the stop loss company reimburses us after that. Um, some benchmarks, Douglas County covers about 76% of total plan costs. So you got all your admin fees, your claims, all that. Um, the, uh, as employees, we cover 24% of those costs between what comes out of our paycheck and then our deductibles and co-insurance. So um, the next step about prescription, I'll run through this pretty quickly. Our X claims usually are pretty easy, um, pretty easy to project and, and they've remained, you know, relatively flat um, over the prior year. Um, our rebates continue to go up and that's, um, that's thanks to Elixir, our, our pharmacy benefit manager. Um, they, they negotiate with drug manufacturers every year to try and get some good rebates and the county gets to keep about 95% of those rebates. So uh, TRIA Health is a pharmacy advocate program. It, it, certain people are identified that could be in that program based on their medical conditions and the prescriptions they take. Um, they can enroll, it's free to them to enroll. They have access to um, a clinical pharmacist. So we do see some hard and soft dollar savings um, with that, with the TRIA Health program. Um, the main purpose of this program is to um, keep people in compliance with their, do you have a question? Oh, you can't? Hang on. I see it. Oh, hang on. No, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Yeah, that's when I was on. But then it's going to. Oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. There, I'll do it down here. Hey, that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, uh, the TRIA Health Program is, um, it, we want people to stay compliant with their medications um, to avoid future costs. You know, take that cholesterol med and avoid that, that heart attack stroke down the road. So that, that's the premises of that. Um, telemedicine is First Stop Health. That is free to um, county employees and, and their family members to use. Um, it's available 24-7. Um, it's for pretty minor things, you know, strep throat, things like that. They can call, get prescriptions sent in. Um, so we do see some soft dollar savings. So we, we about break even with our, with our investment in, in that benefit. So, so this is kind of getting into what we really want to talk about for our 2022 plan year. Um, these are projections. Um, for the uh, renewal 6-1 of, of 22. Um, everything stays the same. We don't make any changes to um, deductibles, co-insurance, um, contributions out of our paychecks, you know, just status quo. We would need about a 4.9% increase in funding, which comes out to about $583,000. So let me caveat real quick. I know we've got Bert Nash here to speak after I'm done. These numbers that I'm going to go through do include Burt Nash on our plan. They're going to talk about being taken off, you know, coming off of our plan and, and starting their own. So these numbers would change without Burt Nash. And I have some of those preliminary numbers from Willis that if we want to talk about, we can. It's not in this presentation um, just because it's not a for sure thing yet. So, um, so with that, with, with the renewal, we want to talk about what it would look like if we would implement um, a consumer-driven healthcare plan. So whether that be in a health savings account, um, which is tied to a high, a qualified high deductible healthcare plan, 
or do we do um, an HRA, which is a health reimbursement account? There are some major differences between the two. Um, I can tell you um, to start off in HSA, uh, the IRS has their hands really deep into your HSA. Um, if you've ever been on a, on a plan like that, the HRA, it runs more like the PPO plan, um, but it, it's kind of a crossover. So um, the HSA, it's a, it's a, that is a physical bank account that the employee gets to keep. Um, you know, if, if the county puts money into that HSA for that employee, I, I mean, it's, it's out of our bank account and it's in theirs and, and they keep it forever. Um, the HRA, it is strictly just funded by the employer, so it's not a physical bank account that the employee will take with them, you know, when they leave. It's basically, it's, it's kind of recorded on paper in the budget, I guess, so to speak. Um, so, like I said, the, the employee would own an HSA, the employer would be, would, would own the HRA. Um, and as far as contributions for an HSA, the employee and the county could contribute. There are maximums that you can put in every year set by the IRS. And the HRA, again, is just employer money. Um, and again, I talked about, the, talked about the limits with the HRA. We have a little bit more freedom in, in how much we want to put in there. Um, and there are limits set by the, by the IRS for HSA. Um, the portability, I kind of talked about um, unused money rolling over, of course, in HSA. That, that money will just sit there until they use it. In HRA, we can build it to roll funds over um, from year to year if we want and help employees build up that fund to, to help cover some medical expenses. Um, so there are, you know, for the HSA, using the money for, for different things. Um, you know, if I have an HSA and I'm, I'm 65, I can take the money out, I pay my taxes. Um, you know, if I want to go buy a boat when I retire, I could do that. If I had enough money in there, I could, I could take it out and do whatever I wanted to do with it, but there are tax implications some penalties. And again, with the HRA, because it's not a physical bank account, um, you don't have employees can't just go withdraw from that account. Um, flexible spending is something we've really trying to, we've tried to educate on, um, the last couple of years, our enrollment in that is, is down a little bit, um, I think because of COVID, um, but with a flexible spending account, you can still have one with an HSA, but it is a limited purpose. So you're only using it for dental and vision. Um, you cannot use your HSA for anything medical. Um, so if you had an HSA and you were out of money and you had medical expenses, um, you, you could not use your, your flexible spending for that. Um, with an HRA, there are no limitations for the, the flexible spending. So um, we could still have a full flexible spending at that point. These are, this is just a snapshot of some potential plan designs. Um, our current plan there is listed, um, the qualified high deductible health plan. These annual deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums, Willis put this, they, they built this um, sheet for us. These are, prob these are averages of what they see across their book of business for a qualified high deductible health care plan tied to an HSA. Um, those numbers are pretty large for our organization. Um, that's nowhere near where we're at now, as you can see. So doing those numbers would, would probably be pretty painful. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest differences with an, H, an HSA versus an HRA one of the things is co-payments. You know, when we when you go to the doctor, you pay your twenty-five dollar co-payment, and the plan picks up the rest of the cost. So the consumer really has no idea, and I'm guilty of it. I've I've seen in several specialists this year for some stuff, and I couldn't tell you to be honest how much that visit cost for that specialist because um, I pay my fifty dollar copay and I go on my way. Um, with an HRA, it would eliminate those copays, and so you would be responsible or the employee would be responsible for paying the cost of that visit until they met their deductible. Um, another big difference, the prescription drugs. If, uh, if I am a heavy prescription drug user, um, especially with these specialty meds, I would, I'd have to pay full cost for meds until I met that, uh, until I met that um, deductible. And with an HSA, a whole, you know, one family member would have to meet um, 
would have to meet the whole deductible before the plan would start paying. So there's just, there's a lot of changes with an HSA that I'm not totally sure this organization is quite ready for. Um, but if you look at the, um, you know, you look at the, the HRA, like I said, it's, um, it, the prescriptions would stay the same as they are now. So we wouldn't have to change that kind of stuff. One family member wouldn't have to meet more than, you know, an individual out-of-pocket maximum. So it runs more closely to what an HR or a, a PPO does. Um, if you look at the very bottom line, those percentages, this is the minus 8.8%. That, that is, that's how much cost would be shifted back into the employee's pocket. Um, and then with the HRA, we'd be shifting about 3.6% of the costs back into the employee's pocket, just, just with the higher deductibles. Um, and then uh, you've got some seed money. Um, you can put some seed money in there for both plans. The, the HRA, the, the $250 for an individual and $500 for a family, that's typical seeding for an HRA. Um, an HSA, $500 and 1000 um, again, pretty typical, um, but the employee can also contribute to that. Um, so those are some of the main differences between the two plans. Um, if, if I could just interject sure. a bit here on this, just as a little bit of background and history. Um, over time, the county's health and uh, employee health insurance plan, we have increased deductibles and co-pays simply to help keep our plan to be more affordable. So the current deductibles at 1,000 to 1,500 are really reflected of what we've had to do to sort of maintain um, our ability to afford the plan. So we're getting very close already to HRA deductibles um, without some of the other plan design changes and that would be helpful in managing the plan more um, effectively. And I guess I want to say all of these numbers are really just ideas. They're, we're not necessarily proposing that this is what the deductible will be. I know we've got employees watching and listening and trying to get information. And I just really want to caveat this again, that this is just to present kind of how this would look um, based off of what the direction the commission gives us tonight. We would come back in April and bring you um, a, re a revised plan design with actual rates for the upcoming plan year. So just don't want anyone to get too locked in on a, any particular number they're seeing on the screen right now. Okay. Thank you. So talking about you know, current plan design, again, we, we went over what kind of increase we would need for that. Um, if we did an HSA um, with the numbers that we saw on that screen, um, you know, with the seed money that, that was quoted there, um, we would be looking at a 0.6% increase in funding needed. So much less um, because you're shifting all of that cost back into the employee's pocket. Um, if we did an HRA, um, as, as it was quoted, we'd need to be about a 3% increase in funding. So about $355,000. So there's a little savings there. Um, again, you're shifting that cost um, some of that cost back into the employee's pocket. Um, to kind of illustrate what would happen with an HRA, um, again, the, the preventive care, this was one of the, the big questions um, that we've gotten. Your preventive care would still be covered at 100%. Um, it does not come out of HRA funds. Um, we want people getting those wellness visits and taking care of themselves. So definitely still, so nothing would change as far as coverage. Um, so what the things that are covered now will continue to be covered under this plan design. It just really comes into the timing of when we as employees pay and when the plan picks up to pay. Um, so just some of the bullets there, um, we talked about the seed money. You know, funds are available on June 1st, on the first day of the plan renewal. Um, and, you know, those, those HRA funds help, help offset some of that deductible. Um, so, you know, with a $1,500 individual deductible, that $250 there at the bottom, that's county money, but it's, it's, it's treated as, as the employee's money. So it goes, to, you know, if you spend that, even though it's not coming out of your pocket, it still goes to help meet that deductible. Um, I guess I'm trying to see, you know, and once you, once you utilize all of the HRA funds, um, we as employees would, would start paying until we met that deductible. 
And then once we meet our deductible, we pay 20% and the plan pays 80%, just like our PPO does now, until we re reach our out-of-pocket maximum. So really does operate a lot the same way. Um, on the family plan, one of the things to, to talk about, um, if I do have a family plan, I get the $500. You know, if I'm the, if I have a large claim right out of the gate, um, I, I would use all $500 for my own claim. So there, then if my husband and my kids had claims, um, that we would be paying out of pocket until we met those deductibles. So, um, and again, just like the PPO, no one family member has to meet more than an individual deductible. Um, so, you know, we do cap it there. Um, and then unused funds can roll over from year to year and we can determine how much we want to let roll over. Um, so if, you're, if you've got some good, good plan years in there, you got some good claims years where you're not really using a lot, you could really build that, that account. And then so when that, you know, that hard year does come through, which we all have every now and then, hopefully you'd have a, a cushion um, to be able to cover some of the costs. So there's some, one of the questions we've gotten is offering two different plan designs. Um, if we would, um, if we would keep our PPO plan in place and then add an, an HRA offering, um, there's, there's pros and cons. It definitely, people like choice and we know that. It could address some affordability concerns for lower wage employees. If we have a healthcare plan with a lower, um, you know, deduction out of your paycheck, the cons, it is definitely more work. Um, you know, we've got Christy and I in, in HR, and we've got right now 800, and 800 employees between, you know, all the outside agencies and, and Douglas County on our plan. Um, that's a lot for one person. She handles the day-to-day -day benefits. Um, and it's, I can tell you, it's, we barely have time to get to some of the other stuff we have on our plates. So, um, and then it just, it does take a lot, you know, just constant education on your plan choices. So people aren't making a choice. They, you know, not making the wrong choice and, and uh, regretting their choice. So, so again, pros and cons. Um, I, I am, I'm a proponent of a, a full replacement and not slicing it up, um, but I do understand people want choice. So um, that is all I had in this presentation. So if you have questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Commissioner Reed. Uh, I don't think that I have any questions right away anyhow, so. Are we commissioners questions? Yeah, this is Commissioner Portillo. Thank you so much for that presentation. This is a lot of work and I know that any shift like this is just yes. a huge undertaking for the organization. Um, I do come from an organization that I, I have an HSA that rolls mm -hmm. over the growth in that as individual. You mentioned the kind of rollover of the HRA. Can you help me understand a bit more what the HRA rollover year to year may look like? Is that at the organization level, at the individual level? It is, level? yeah, okay. it is, yeah, it's on, on paper. Um, okay. they, would, they would track it at Trustmark, who was our third party administrator, and they process all of our claims for us. So it would be kept on record there. Um, I would basically send them, you know, every June 1st, they would automatically, you know, dump 250 or $500 into everybody's HRAs and then whatever's left at the end of the year just carries over and then we just, we add again. So it's just record Could be kept a bit there. Individual employee, but tracked through Trustmark. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank yep. you. That was the part I was not quite understanding. Yeah. <laughs> we were then kind of dispersing those funds across the organization or yeah. if they stayed with the individual. They stay with, with the, the individual. individual. Yep. So they can kind of build up. They can. Account. They just can't it take just it with them with when them. they leave, if they okay. would leave. Um, you know, an HSA, if, if the county puts a thousand dollars into your HSA mm -hmm. and then you leave a month later, you're taking that thousand dollars with you. Um, it's, it's hard dollars. And um, one of the things with an HSA, at least the one I have, you can invest through it. You can. And so I'm assuming with HRA, that you wouldn't can, be happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The anymore. HSA, okay. is, it's a triple tax benefit. Um, you put in tax-free, you take out tax-free, it grows tax-free. Um, we would have some logistics um, I, that would be fairly difficult because we have retirees on our plan and we have to offer, by law, we have to offer retirees um, the same plan they had when they were here. Um, so trying to work that out would be tricky um, because they have no way, 
to contribute through payroll deduction. Um, we would have to set up bank accounts um, for these retirees and we have 90 retirees on our plan. We would have to have accounts for them um, at a, a maybe a bank of our choice and we would have to put money into it for them. Um, oh, that's very complicated. Yeah, it's, it's, it's required by law that, that, we, that we give them the same money that we're giving. We have to do it with COBRA participants. So there would be some logistics there that would be a little difficult to tackle. And that wouldn't be the case with the HRA mm -hmm. because it would all be handled. Because through. it's all at Trustmark. Okay. Yep. Thank you. That's very mm -hmm. helpful. Oh, yeah. Ms. Commissioner Kelly, Michelle, I really appreciate your work on this. You know, this is something that I asked about very yeah. early on and it's, um, a huge part of our budget and it's a part of our budget that we have to approve very early on and so um, I think I really appreciate our employees understanding that, that, that we appreciate them and that we value this and we value this benefit and that we're right now just looking at this as an option. Right. Can you walk me through a little bit how you've let employees know about this, what's been the process. I think before I've asked, is there sort of like any employee advisory committee or something like that that's that's giving you feedback? Yeah, so we did, I started a, um, a healthcare committee and we've got a representative from every department. Um, we've had two meetings so far, which this was one of my goals when I started here and then COVID hit and so that took a back burner. Um, and so I did this exact presentation with the healthcare committee. They took it back to their their, their work groups and then brought some feedback. Um, it was, some of it was feedback. Some of it was just questions on, you know, logistics and um, I mean, good, bad, or otherwise, I mean, it's, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's always going to be good and bad feedback. Um, I, I implemented this exact same type of plan when I was at the city um, and, you know, we had 850 employees there um, and through heavy education, you know, I did face-to-face -face meetings, which Christy and I want to do um, this spring as well, um, since we're all, you know, we are able to kind of get back into person. Um, I think doing those face-to-face -face meetings and being able to answer questions instead of just doing a Zoom and recording it and sending it out, you know, doing it live with people and, and being able to answer those questions is helpful. Um, and because I have made this kind of switch before for a large group, um, I brought a lot of my work with me when I left the city and came here. So I have a lot of that stuff already done. Um, so, and we've been, I mean, we have been throwing out these terms now for a year. Um, you know, we even, I even talked about it during open enrollment last year that we could be, I even had a slide during my open enrollment, we could be looking at doing this. Um, so they've heard the terms at least. So, um, but it, it's, it's definitely a communication campaign. Thank you for that. And I'm also interested if you've considered it, it looked like when you run two plans, you're running a choice option. Mm -hmm. um, other organizations I've heard have grandfathered. So if you're, um, if you've, if you're an employee today, you, you can still get this plan or not. Have you run that idea at all? I mean, that so, does help with the retiree situation. Uh, yeah, I have not, I no, I never thought about, you know, grandfathering anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I think again, um, administratively trying to keep track of all of that, you mm -hmm. know, might be a little difficult. Um, you know, one of the reasons I did a, a full replacement before, and, and I think Willis would I don't know that they have strong feelings either way, a full replacement or slicing it up. Um, you know, one of the things you get when you when you start to slice, you know, and, and have the offerings, you you keep your PPO plan. Um, it's it's more expensive because the deduct deductibles are lower, so um, more comes out of your paycheck. Um, you keep you keep. I, it sounds mean, but you know your sick population or whatever, or your heavy users stay in that plan. Um, and then you get your healthy population moving over to the HRA plan. It doesn't save any money anywhere because you're keeping this big group over here that's sick and then they're just there. You know, we've only, we've probably got 15% of our organization or, or of our members that drive 90% of our costs. Um, so those people will all stay in that plan and there won't be any change. 
um, they'll, I guess we'll get more out of paychecks if we increase the, you know, premiums, but, um, you know, one philosophy at a previous employer I was at was they, they priced out the PPO. I mean, they make it so unaffordable and I'm like, I, why would I, I don't want to do that. That's, that's not very transparent. I don't think that's a good philosophy. So. But, but if you did a grand, I mean, originally your cost would be the same, but it would slowly taper down. Right. And honoring those employees who came in, understanding that the benefit was this health plan. And I, I do think in Douglas County, we have employees who really see the, sure. our current insurance as a big benefit. Yes. Um, and, so. we, and we could certainly talk to Willis about that and what that would look like. And um, I mean, they've, they've got hundreds of clients, so I'm sure they've seen it before. Um, yeah, so we could certainly talk to them about what that looks like. Any other questions from commissioners? Okay, we'll go ahead and open this up for public comment. Is there anyone here who would like to make public comment? Please come forward. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, I'm Darren Harrison. I'm an employee here in IT. Um, been here for about nine months now. Um, wasn't necessarily planning on talking in at this meeting, but, uh, and looking over the information that we'd been presented with from the meetings you guys had earlier in the week. Um, so I, I did get that information. So I was appreciative. You guys actually asked some of the questions that I had. So that was, that was good to hear. Um, as I said, I've been here about nine months. Um, my previous employers had what we're talking about as an option but we had like a three-tiered plan in place. So we had something similar to what we have now as our upper tier, and then like a couple of lower tiers below that. Um, we're a couple hundred employees instead of what you said, there's like four or 500 on the, uh, or well, I guess more like 800, I guess you said, under the, under the current plan here. So that would be a, a difference in administration for sure. Um, but what we'd be looking at, um, again, those were sample numbers, not necessarily what we'd be really looking at. Uh, but you're talking about, you know, a 4% a increase in the cost of the county on the current plan. Um, but for me, for my family plan, I'd be looking at a $2,000 increase in my out-of-pocket expenses. Um, a $1,500 increase before benefits kick in at all. Um, for me, that, that's a big concern. Uh, I have a family member that is in the hospital every three or four months for a medical condition. One trip to the hospital, I'm looking at meeting that maximum plan all at once. Uh, that's, that's a hard thing to look at. Uh, you know, when, I, when I came here, I was looking at multiple positions part of my factor in my decision-making was the benefits packages that were here. And those are looking at significant changes. And I, I realized no decision has been made uh, and you're waiting for more numbers, but I, I definitely hope you bring those considerations into your decision-making. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else here with us in the courthouse as public comment? Hi, my name is Gerard Lewis, I'm an employee in information technology. I've been here for 16 years. Uh, I'm not nearly as prepared because I didn't think I was going to be able to make the meeting tonight, so I apologize. I've been very, very pleased with our health care. Guys, it's good. <laughs> it has done wonders for myself. It has saved the life of my wife, in my opinion. I know health care is expensive. I understand that. I understand that we have to look at different ways. Um, some of the questions I have in my head were answered tonight. Thank you for that. I have a lot more and I'm just not in the ability right now to ask them properly because I, I can't make sense of them. I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't. But I hope that we do have time to get those questions answered either email or 
you know, face to face. And I'd like, I think we need to really, really look at how we do this because it is a benefit. And uh, it's a good one. And it's important to a lot of the employees. I know it's important to me. So I, I understand that costs go up. And, you know, if we keep our current plan, I understand my premium would go up. I'm in the same situation Darren is that I would look at an extra $2,000 a year out of pocket, you know, and uh, even f f that's going to hurt. <laughs> um, so I, I do hope that we take a lot of time. And I know that a lot of time has been taken already to look at this. I, I hope that we take more time and discuss it a lot with a lot more of the employees. So thank you very much. Thank you both for your comments. One last call for anybody here at the courthouse. Okay. Uh, is there anybody online that's indicated to want to speak? Okay. Commissioners, I, I do want to take an opportunity. I know we talked about um, some options at the end about, you know, how would we manage multiple plans? I'm going to restate again. This staff is extremely limited. If, if we have to maintain multiple plans, I'm probably gonna come back and ask for more staff. Um, I really don't feel like we have the capacity to manage multiple plans with the existing staff we have. I, I don't want that to necessarily detract from if that's the decision we wanna make. I just want us to be fully understanding of what's gonna take to, to make sure that this is done well and properly. We take this very seriously. It's a job I used to do, I, I think it's, really important, but we've done it with a very, very tight lean staff. And so I, I just I, I just want that to be part of the conversation that as, as you guys are thinking about the things you want us to consider as we contemplate plan design, we may come back with some additional asks as to how we ad adequately administer what we do. Thank you, Sarah. That was Commissioner Reed. I appreciate that um, you mentioning that and did want to um, ask a follow up question about if you're if you're able to identify how much more staff you think you would need in order to have choices rather than a full transition to to just one. Well, I mean, if I mean, we need additional staff now. Like okay. without That's what even I doing that. <laughs> so, so yeah, so if we had a full-time person, you know, an admin assistant or whatever it might be, Christy could get rid of the, you know, the two foot high stack of filing. And, um, you know, then we, we could have someone do that, that admin work. Um, but, you know, a, a full-time staff person would, we would, we would keep very, very busy. In my opinion, I don't know. Yeah, what. no, I, I completely agree. And what I would say is that, you know, it's important to remember here that we're self-insured. So the entire fiscal and fiduciary responsibility for this entire health plan, which is the total spend, oh, what are we hitting now? 15 million? 12. 12 um, is is completely on this team. Um, so it's, it's more than just like writing a check to the insurance company every month. It is the entire... Um, responsibility of managing the fiscal side of the relationship. So I'd say like, we'd probably need another staff person at, at a minimum, and then some time to figure out how that would work. Okay. Now, if I think if we did a total plan conversion, I think we could manage with where we are with an HRA model. Um, and that's gonna factor into staff recommendation if, you know, would, would factor into that decision. And HSA requires additional work outside. So I think that would also require staff as well okay you read my mind that was my yep. follow-up question was that between the two plans if you felt like you needed additional staff either way um yeah i think it's more about plan or? conversion and i think it's more about plan conversion and the hsa does require a lot more specificity sure. and, and i also agree with michelle that is a significant departure from where we've been it's it would not be staff's recommendation to move to a, uh, a that plan at this time. I'm interested in hearing my fellow commissioners thoughts. 
again, thank you for this. Thank you so much for the comments. And I 100% hear what you're saying that one of the big benefits of coming to work for the county is the really amazing benefits package. I will also say that last year during our budget discussions, seeing the, we had multiple times when we were looking at approving positions and paying for benefits for those positions was over 50% of the cost of those positions. And so these costs are extremely high for the county. It makes me really sad for the state of our country, for the state of public service, for the state of everything that we don't have single payer health care that would alleviate these local costs. And it's it's something that I hope we continue to push for at the federal level, but that's not going to fix our budget or discussions today. Um, I, I really appreciated what Commissioner Kelly said about kind of that grandfathering as a way to step down, but I hear what you're saying when it comes to administrative burden. I think that this is an area where we need to consider the capacity and that we may need more capacity in this department to think about these things. Um, but ultimately, this conversation also ties in with our conversation about making sure that we're paying folks market rate for all of their positions and how do we balance out increasing salaries, which we need to do in order to attract and retain talent and having a sustainable benefits package. And so I, I would like to hear a bit more about if there is any sort of possibility of grandfathering in the PPO, even if that means increasing, not attempting to price out in a right. <laughs> duplicitous way, but increasing the amounts that were, the premiums that we're asking of our employees if they wanna keep that, and then giving an option to current employees and then saying all new employees have to go with the HRA option. And it would be a way to say that those new employees don't have a choice, grandfathered employees do have a choice, but over time, attrition will lead us towards that HRA. It may be that we could consider a phase out and a phase in to the HRA. I don't know what that would look like from kind of an administrative burden piece of it, if, if our insurance companies will work with us to do something like that. Um, but I would love to hear just a bit more about what a phase out through grandfathering and attrition or a phase out through saying here, we have X number of years and let's also work to get salaries up over those years, knowing that we're going to have an increased out-of-pocket cost for employees. I think we can definitely come back with some options about a transition. Um, I would suggest that it be a transition-based program over a certain period of years. One of the other things we are really blessed here with at Douglas County is employees who've worked here for decades. Um, so I, you know, the thought it just, we change this plan every year. So it's also important to know that even those that would be grandfathered, they would not be grandfathered to the exact same deductibles, co-pays, premiums, all of those things. So it eventually, like, it would be good to transition everybody to a plan that they're going to get similar enough because, I mean, deductibles are going to go up. So it, I, I just want us to be cautious as when we say grandfathered, some people think that means for eternity. Um, and so I just want us to be cautious as we talk about those, that transition, but we could certainly look at developing a transition program, what we could do to premiums to make it, and then putting new employees into a, a particular program. So I think that's something definitely Willis could help us come back with. And we do, I mean, looking at, looking at wages, you know, like, like we said, employees come here to work, you know, you don't, you don't work in government to get rich. Um, it's, they, they come for the benefits. Um, and it's and attracting um, talent has been more challenging this year than I've seen it in my 18 years in human resources. Never seen anything like it. Um, so it is super important. It's a balancing act. Um, I, you know, there's no right or wrong answer, um, but we do need to pay attention to that. So <clears throat> I'm glad to hear you say that public employees don't work to get rich because we've heard other public comment around that tonight um but uh, it, it, i want to thank our, our our employees for coming and speaking and both of you um said you weren't prepared it that's the feedback that we need it really is we we really value our county employees and, and i'm really not interested in 
and anything that sweeps away our current plan and and you know really impacts those employees because that's when you took the job that's what you signed up for and i don't think that's fair as an employer to suddenly sweep that out from under you so i am interested in hearing more about what the staffing needs are to make sure that your department i agree with you sarah that we should do it over a number of years so that people know you know we could even look at like you can stay on this plan for so many years but then eventually those plans are going to come together um and and i think as long as we're up front with employees we're talking to them about why they understand that and they have time to make choices based on what we've shared with them i think and i think that's really important because as electeds <laughs> It gets scary when every time your boss constantly changes, right? So I, I think making those assurances as best we can. Um, and Michelle, you do a great job. Every employee that I talk to says you do a great job of sharing with them their options. They understand. We heard that tonight. And I, I think that's the key thing is to keep our employees engaged. I don't have a problem, Sarah, with adding more staff on this. I think we, this commission has told you time and time again, we need more staff. and. <laughs> I think, um, you know, whether we make the move to a, a grandfathered plan or a choice plan, or we stay with our plan, we've got to get you more staff, Michelle, because I think that that tells our 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 employees that they're important. You know, I'm I'm going to guess that you answer the phone the minute they call and that they um, get their emails answered within 24 hours. But in case not, we need to think about <laughs> making sure that we have the support for that. So we continue to get good employees. Commissioner Portia is exactly right. We need to pay our public employees more. And I know our employees understand that it's a balance between their benefit packages and their wages. We are in a, a workforce crisis right now in our country and we need to adapt to that. And, and I think everybody is going, that's gonna, there's gonna be lots of loss around that and how we do that, but it's really important to pay those employees who I think we're gonna be very busy early tomorrow morning <laughs> and we need to pay them a decent wage and give them appropriate benefits. So I, for one, on the, on the motion we have tonight, I'm not really comfortable voting on that motion yet. I think we've given you a lot to think about and ask for some more information before we're comfortable voting on that motion. So that's just my, my space commissioners. Thank you. I, this commissioner Reed, um, agree with both of you and think you made some really important points. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciate the idea of figuring out what a um, transition can look like because of exactly what you said, Michelle, that this is a, it's a balancing act and it's a um, lot of not fun truths, right? The workforce crisis we're in, the, um, the low, lower than we want salaries for many of our public service employees um, and the rising costs of medical care. Um, it really puts us in a, a tough situation. So I want us to um, do our very best to find the balance um, in a way that really uh, honors that what has been said repeatedly here tonight and I really appreciate um, to our employees coming up and sharing their personal experiences with that that the benefits are very attractive um, and I hear that time and time again and have for years well before becoming a commissioner so um, that on that point I really want to appreciate how intentional you and our administrative staff are about answering those questions, making things clear, helping folks make informed choices. Um, and I, I know and have every faith that that will continue through the transition, but that it is obviously going to be significantly more work um, and some additional burden. So we'll just um, echo again that yes, you all need more staff and we support that and I really want to, um, we want you to be able to come here and tell us in confidence um, that you've got a system that's working um, for you all day to day and that's helping address those different issues in a balanced way um, that doesn't leave anyone in the lurch, so to speak. So I just really appreciate um, 
what a difficult space this is and how many different pressure points there are. Um, and how, I mean, I was telling Commissioner Kelly before that some of the, the numbers and the way the, the statistics and all of it can go a little bit over my head sometimes, but you truly have a way of helping um, communicate it in a way that makes sense um, and that really talks about the options that we have in front of us as a commission. So I just really appreciate all You're that welcome. work and thank you. thank you for continuing to work on it as we've given you some more to chew on tonight. So, so I, this is Commissioner Portillo. Sorry, sir. Oh, you go ahead. I was just going to say, as far as tonight, then I think that we're not going to vote on the motion in front of us. Would it be helpful if we? I mean, it sounds like what we're asking for, and I'm just trying to get a sense of consensus here. We're asking for what a transition may look like and what the capacity and staffing needs may be transition, no transition. Do yes, you need that's... us to vote on that, or are you okay with kind of direction that we've given thus far? I think that that consensus from the commissioners to work on a further recommendations and further information in that direction is something we can do without a motion. And then we would bring that back to you though, kind of our hope would be to do this before we set rates. Um, and I think that is important to know what our plan design is as we set rates. And so, you know, we try to bring that back to you as soon as we can get that information together, knowing that we're getting pretty close to that timeline. So does that work for you, Michelle? Does that yeah. give you kind yeah. of what you think you well, need? Well, and, you know, like I said at the beginning, you know, Bert Nash is here to present. I don't know, you know, where that conversation will go this evening, but, you know, depending on what happens there, again, it, it our numbers would change. Um, those numbers you looked at, you know, won't be accurate at that point. So, um, so yeah, it kind of depends on where, what direction that goes. Yeah, Michelle, and that's what I was good. I think there's a lot of moving pieces here. Yeah especially, and I, it just needs to be, I don't know, maybe it doesn't need to be said, but I'm gonna say it, that as we look at transitioning plans, that could affect our rates yes. because of the number of people within the plan. And I know that's gonna be hard for Willis to project because we, we may not know. I mean, that's a problem when you give a choice, you don't know how many people are gonna end up in each category. Right. But I, I think our employees understand that we're, we're trying to slowly make that move and that there will be some uh, lack of clarity maybe here for a little bit as right. we try to figure this and, out. And I have talked to Willis about that. Um, you know, typically when you start to offer two different plans, they see about a 10% migration. Um, so, you know, I've got charts where I can change those numbers and, and see what it does to our bottom line. Um, and again, they've, they've given us some projections, you know, without the, the Burt Nash group on our plan um, and what that looks like. So yeah, we, we can definitely play with that. Thank, thank you. you again. Okay, Appreciate your time. Have All right, a good rest you of your evening. Okay. Oh, actually, I guess I should do, no, we already did the public comment and brought it back. Sorry, <laughs> the order of which things are happening are a little scattered. Um, okay, so we will move on to item 3.3, the discussion of Burt Nash Health Insurance. Commissioners, Patrick Schmitz with Burt Nash is here to present this item. Patrick, do you, can you get the screen shared? Yep. Thank you. Just hoping to go without glasses, but. open it first. Hold on a second. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come tonight to do a follow-up on uh, conversations that we started last summer. Uh, I'm Patrick Schmidt, CEO for Burt Nash, and with me tonight is Stephen O'Neill, our COO, and Sean Miller, 
CEO of the Miller Group, and I'll bring them up as we have questions, but I'll just run through this, uh, the presentation part uh, with all of you uh, to get started. Real quick, uh, uh, history, uh, just first, thank you for the years and years of support that you have provided to Burt Nash uh, around the health insurance, but in all other ways. You know, many years ago, and, and no one, uh, I think, during this process took the time to go back and see how many years this arrangement has been in place, but it's been in place for many years. And when I've talked to uh, former commissioners or uh, former elected officials, you know, they recall the reason for this was to ensure that mental health services were available, uh, affordable to the public. And this was an easy way to kind of help support uh, the mental health center uh, throughout the years. So again, thank you for that uh, on behalf of uh, the Burt Nash employees and the community uh, as a whole. Um, ours is a little different. Okay. Um, so, you know, just as has been said many times tonight, this has been a significant benefit. It's something that attracts people to uh, for us. Uh, and it has helped us bring in more and more of a workforce to support the needs of this community uh, around mental health services. Um, but we also recognize that uh, because we have growth, it adds cost uh, to, to you, not only in, in terms of the insurance uh, premium, but also, of course, uh, in terms of the liability and claims paid. Uh, currently, Douglas County pays 90% of the health premiums for uh, Burt Nash employees. Uh, and of course, due to the rising costs of health insurance, uh, several large claimants uh, that we've had, our growth, we know that this is becoming uh, unsustainable for the county. Current projected costs uh, with a, a rough employment uh, enrollment, I should say, our employees, not all of them, of course, take the insurance. Uh, of 172 for uh, 2022 would be about 2 million uh, 800 or 2 million uh, uh, in, in cost for uh, for the county. Uh, as I said last uh, year uh, in the summer when we came here to talk uh, about budget, uh, Commissioner, uh, you asked us to take a look, uh, and we had actually, as I, if you recall, I'd said we had actually started the conversation the week before, uh, and so. Uh, Following our conversation, we worked with a couple of potential insurance representative companies and selected the Miller Group uh, as, a, as, a, an, as our broker, uh, if you will, to help us consider what was possible out there uh, for the Burton Ash uh, Center if we were to move into our own uh, plan. Just next, Wait, wrong direction. There we go. So what, after uh, many months of taking a look and seeing what was uh, out there, and we have uh, met with uh, Sarah, uh, and I wanna thank Michelle for all her help in helping us gather the data and talk about the, what was possible. What we would uh, like to propose, uh, should the commission uh, choose to go this route, uh, is that Douglas County consider financially supporting Burt Nash's uh, migration to an alternate plan in a phased manner. You see the phased manner, uh, just a proposal. Again, just like the other numbers you saw tonight on the county side, it's a proposal uh, to help us move towards our own plan. Uh, we would want you to, sh we would recommend shifting the funding uh, of support from health insurance to support primarily for the under and uninsured. Uh, and, and that's not an exact, I mean, that would be something we would figure out how to best do that. Um, it's, it comes from the same account, so just shift it um, and illustrate it differently. Uh, there's some advantages to that, which I'll talk about um, as well. We would suggest migrating no later than 5-1-2022. The importance of that is if we can take those roughly 172 individuals off of the county health insurance, uh, you, of course, you remove that uh, liability of those individuals. And I, as I said, we have several large claimants that historically for uh, uh, several years, and as far as we can tell, project into the future, will remain large claimants. And so you remove your risk uh, for them by, uh, by thinking about going this direction. Yeah. 
Um, we believe that this uh, proposal is mutually beneficial in the immediate and of course the long term. We are removing risk from Douglas County Health Plan. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a few claimants that have generated in excess of a million dollars a year in claims. Uh, with the rapidly increasing employee count due to it, the increasing demand for services, uh, the cost and risk for the county would increase even further under the current arrangement. And again, right now, um, Sarah doesn't limit us on that. And, and we've been very lucky, so it has allowed us to do some growth, but being mindful, you guys cannot continue, the public cannot continue to support that growth uh, in this part all on their own. Uh, and we have some uh, opportunities in front of us to do something different. Um, under the certified community behavioral health centers, uh, we'll be able to include the cost of our health insurance under our PPS rate. And, and this will then be reimbursed by Medicaid. I'm not gonna go real deep into that. We have a study session on the CCBHC next week and we can talk more fully about how that would be incorporated as well as some of the other expenses. Uh, and just to give you a heads up, I think Commissioner Brown uh, from KDES will be able to join us next week for that conversation. So uh, he'll be able to help uh, on a lot of the other parts. Uh, this will bring more federal resources uh, to the community. Uh, again, through the PPS rate, this will then free up the county resources to fund other projects over time. Um, we estimate that our proposed funding plan would save the county approximately uh, 900 to a million dollars per year in the near term and even more going forward as we grow. Uh, we anticipate growing uh, due to the CCBHC and some of the other projects uh, to well over 300 employees uh, in the next year. Who knows how many of those would end up taking health insurance, but I would imagine a fair number would, would do so. And so this would help save in that regard. Uh, the continued financial support at some level over a few years will allow Burt Nash to continue meeting uh, Douglas County's growing need for mental health services, uh, which has of course been exacerbated by the pandemic and will so for years to come uh, as, as this continues. Um, and, um, sorry, we're not doing a normal, I think that's it. Questions? Commissioner Reed, uh, <clears throat> I do not have any questions, but appreciate your time this evening and the work that you all have done to, um, to come up with a proposal for some transition. So any questions from fellow commissioners? This is Commissioner Portillo, and this question may be more for Sarah than for Patrick. Um, I saw that the proposal is a five-year expectation of kind of step down we vote on our budget every year right and this is funding to an external agency right so i want us to be clear i don't think that we can agree to anything that would commit and, and our I've, commission yeah i had meant to say i know you cannot commit to a five-year plan we would just want to project or at least suggest that that thought be planted uh for the future uh discussions it's possible under the ccbhc we could be able to do something different uh even sooner if you had, if we had to, we're still learning about the impact of that and how that will help us. Um, and we'll learn more about it next week when, when uh, we're here to talk about it. So I, I totally get, you cannot commit to a future commission uh, in a future budget year. Um, yep. Patrick, I'm looking at the fourth slide. It shows the four year proposal there. And one of the questions is, as you talk about increasing staff, and you're talking about 90% or 50%. And I don't know how this table looks, but as you go to 50%, if you're increasing staff, the dollars might change what, as well, right? What we're, what we're suggesting is that the uh, 1.927 be the, the rate, the, the amount, and that it, you decrease it uh, proportionately based on that number, not on our growing number. Okay. Any further questions? Sarah, did you, you have something? We didn't, and this is just kind of a logistic thing as we mm -hmm. were putting this presentation into the packet. Um, I'd be interested if the commission wants to, we didn't give you a suggested motion to take direction. And, but so I think we would like some direction if you want to make a decision tonight 
if, to give Burton Ash that direction moving forward, or if we want to bring this back for a motion at another time, I guess I'd also look to you, Patrick, to what your what you'd like to get from the commission tonight. Right. I, I think based on what I what we heard earlier with with Michelle's presentation and what we may learn next week, we might be able we should probably should delay this. And again, it's not on here as an action item, so we could probably delay this a couple of weeks. But we would want to make a decision fairly soon, one direction or other. Do you want us to move off? If so, what could be that level of support to do that? Uh, so that we can plan and prepare and finalize our own plan design because that will be heavily dependent on uh, whatever agreement uh, that you have for going forward for the support uh, here uh, this year, potentially next year. Um, so the, the sooner we do it, the better for planning purposes, as well as if you say, yeah, we want you to move on, uh, then we get off of your risk. That gives Willis uh, time to prepare what changes that has on your numbers, uh, both in terms of your plan design, but your overall cost. So I wouldn't want to delay it very long. So we, we need to take public comment, but I had one more question sure. here, Patrick, and that is you heard from Michelle about the workload. And one thing I've noticed is that your human, would the workload on this plan shift to your department? Yeah. That's a great point. And I did make that note, but since it wasn't on there, I didn't add that. But by shifting those approximately 172 people off of your plan, it does free up some of the work. And I don't know what all the work they do, but I know that if I have a question, I have to I go to them and they have to answer that question. So I imagine that's true for 172 of our employees. Right. That, that flow will stop, at least on our part. It still leaves you oh, only 600 and some people on your plan. Yeah. So... That's something we definitely would take into consideration yeah. as we would evaluate what our plan needs. So the timing is great that we're here tonight to have the same conversation. Yeah. And I think we could take that into account. So thank you for bringing up that point, Commissioner Kelly. Um, I, before we finish our come back to discussion, I'm gonna open this up for public comment. Is there anybody here in the courthouse that wants to provide public comment? Seeing none, I'll check if anybody's raised their hand online. And nope. So we'll go ahead and close public comment and bring this back for any further discussion or comments from commissioners. I, I can so I, at first glance, this looks really exciting. I want to learn more. And I think we're that next week we have that work session or two weeks. Right? Next week is the CCBHC conversation. Yeah. And study I, session. the timing is really good with what we heard from Michelle. And, and I think just talking a lot of, you know, talking a lot about workload and things like that. I think we, we have a lot of questions to still answer there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, from my perspective, tremendous your team. We know that Burt Nash is a high user of our healthcare plan. Just, I mean, the employees we have at Burt Nash demographically are a little different than the employees we have at Douglas County. And so it'll be interesting to see how this impacts. And, and I appreciate you recognizing the burden. It's not a burden. That's a terrible word to use. I apologize for using that. The impact mm -hmm. that Burton Ash has on our overall budget, including that health care plan. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Again, I think we need a single payer healthcare system. It really bothers me that this is at all a discussion for local governments and how we have to use our very limited funds. Um, I agree with what Commissioner Kelly said. It, it is very exciting to see this moving forward. I'm particularly excited about kind of the workload shift, not just the financial, but the workload shift from our HR department. Um, I, I do still have some concerns about kind of this stepwise approach. And I'm hoping that as we have our discussion next week, and as we continue to think about our budget overall, this is, Burt Nash is the only one of our external partners that we have this current arrangement with. And I know it's been a longstanding arrangement. I know it is because our community cares deeply about mental health, and we want to make sure that those services are available. Um, but providing, a, providing benefits for another organization is something that I I feel very weird about. And I think that I'm excited that we're moving in this direction. I'd like to see if 
again, we don't know what our budget is going to be four years from now as a local government. We can't make decisions about those expectations for future commissioners. Um, but I'd like to continue the conversation of can we see a, maybe a, a quicker turnover in this? Or could we see some of those cost shift? Because we're still talking about about $2 million, which affects what we can spend for benefits for our employees here, what we can spend for salaries for our employees here in the first year, and then kind of going down from there. So what, 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 and I'll be really clear, our proposal very clearly is do not take this dollars, these dollars, whatever that is, and shift it outside of the mental health or behavioral health system, repurpose it within the behavioral health system for services. If, if what you honestly, if what you do is take this money and spend it outside of the system, because in a sense, that's what you're doing by giving for Nash this benefit, you will, you will reduce what's available to the system. And Sarah, I think you're probably better at saying yeah. this. And, and I actually think, and Patrick and I have already had conversations about this. I think the transition to the CCBHC model is going to necessitate this change in conversation anyway. And so what we would look to do is change the entire community funding partner arrangement right. with Burt Nash to be more aligned with that model, take these funds that had traditionally shown up in our community partner line, as well as the other funding for community partner, and move all of that into a different model, along with all the other, you know, direct uh, program expenses that we help support for Burt Nash and really look at the agreement in total. I think what Patrick and I were thinking about when that slide was up was the support, the dollar amount, but not in that same manner. Right. And so, and, and obviously the commission would be and a that, part of that going forward. Right. It is that, sorry, that's fine. And I think it really is shifting how we're supporting yes. Burt Nash. That's yeah. important. I think we're all on the same right. page on that. And yes. that's obviously something that would we would continue to explore as we go through the budget process and and really see how this model impacts Burt Nash moving forward. So yes. I appreciate that feedback. Yes. And and we we recognize you can't commit that far out. But again, simply a, a suggestion, an idea to begin to talk. Um, and then we will obviously have to look at it every year as to uh, what what's needed and how best to do it. The idea is to keep services available, not reduce them. Well, I think that's the direction we need. And then our hope would be is maybe after next week and in the near future, you guys could get, we could get you back on our agenda to make a formal action. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good rest of your evening. I'm just gonna check in with fellow commissioners and see if anybody needs a break. I just have we just have one more. I just wanted to check in. So, um, okay. Uh, 3.4 on our regular agenda um, is the Community Navigator Program Service Agreement. Jill, will you be sharing with us about this? I will. Um, commissioners, thank you for this opportunity to um, briefly share and um, uh, get your authorization for the county administrator to sign the agreement that was attached in the agenda packet. Um, this um, project uh, provided a, a, an outline of what we're proposing. Um, this is a one-time um, funding agreement on the part of Douglas County um, to utilize funds from the peer support program that um, Douglas County has had um, um, for at least a couple years now. Um, that's largely been led um, by Bob Transky, our director of behavioral health projects. Um, the peer alignment with resource navigation has happened over the course of several months um, and a collaborative effort between the agencies that are um, discussed in the agreement. Um, United Way of Douglas County and I'm grateful to have Mandy Enfield um, here with us tonight to um, talk about the program, answer any questions if they come up. Um, the Eudora Resource Center um, that the United Way has helped has supported um, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, which is supported um, and has been led um, through the efforts of Mary Kirkendall um, and um, the Eudora Library, um, which was has been a supporter of this effort um, from the beginning as well. And i um, grateful to have Carol Wolford and Mary Kirkendall um, available um, as attendees tonight too, to talk about the program or answer any questions. Um, I do, while, while we have Bob here, um, I, I think we wanna just make sure we um, address from the outset 
um, how we're using these peer dollars that we're not just using the peer support dollars to make the program work. We want to make the, the community navigator um, program work. Um, we want to demonstrate that it can be successful and how we can expand it to be a truly a countywide program. But the, um, the layering of peers in this program is really um, something that just makes a ton of sense um, and is going to be a, um, a benefit to the program and the, the folks that it serves. And I think you'll hear that from Bob. And I'd like to let um, Mary just briefly talk about the benefit that she has seen in her work having been through the peer training. So um, I'm gonna hand it off to Bob real quick to kick things off. Thank you, Jill. Um, I think the best way to set this in context is to talk about what the overall goal of the Peer Fellows Program is. And that is that it's a, it's a workforce development project and it's a professional development pro project and program for those people who are participating in the Peer Fellows Program. It's like Teach for America. So people who would like to do peer support work, people with direct lived experience with substance abuse, addiction, um, homelessness, um, have the opportunity to work part-time. Um, uh, they, they serve in a community setting. Um, we started with six peers from Burt Nash who worked in the emergency department. In year two, we expanded from the emergency department to the Lawrence Public Library and the Lawrence Douglas Cal County Housing Authority. Last year, we added two peers from KU Med who were working at the library and then also doing some peer support work in the community with individuals experiencing homelessness at the winter camp, for example. Um, and you know, there are a couple of skill sets that are really essential to be effective in a peer support role. Um, one of them is providing support, but another is connecting people with resources. And it is really complicated to um, have a well-trained group of people who are experts at being able to you know, help people complete a housing authority application uh, to know how to refer somebody to care coordination and, and to make that connection, um, to understand uh, the, the complexity involved in navigating some of the, the legal hurdles and challenges. Uh, and so we think that this partnership has the opportunity to bring the ability to develop that resource navigation capacity with those people who are working as as peer supports uh, in the program, um, and so we think it's a we think it's a win win. It's an opportunity to expand beyond what we've done at the Lawrence Public Library and to to put that capacity in Eudora and in Baldwin. Um, there are conversations that are going on as we look at the program long term um, of things we might be able to do with KU libraries. So the idea of placing peer support in a library setting really has a lot of merit. Um, communities around the country are experimenting with this and having a lot of success. And if you think about it, you know, peers can be a different type of first responder um, and make that initial connection with people in the community who are really struggling and are not engaged in services, are not connected with resources and really struggling to even understand what's possible in front of them. Um, and so this, this next step for us, we see it as kind of a partnership to continue to increase that capacity uh, for peers to be really expert at helping people to navigate these challenges in the community. Thanks, Bob. Um, Mary, can you talk briefly about um, how you see that, that your work moving um, throughout the year, what we've talked about as a project team, um, and um, your efforts you know, you, to try to spread this program um, beyond Eudora and um, look to our partners in Baldwin as well? Hello, commissioners. Thanks for having me. So I've only been doing the work now. I started January 1st in this position, although we have been building capacity behind something like this for the last 10 months or so, maybe a year. And it started in Eudora. There's definitely needs. I ended up doing peer work without that training and not knowing that I was doing that. I mean, yes, it is resource navigation, but I was doing a lot of the work that I see now because of the, the seminar that I'm attending with Bob. 
And I see this marrying these two concepts really beneficial um, in supporting community members. And I believe that this work needs to continue happening in Eudora. And I see the library as the perfect place to do that. Also in talking with the uh, library director in Baldwin and some of their uh, commission members, they also think that this is a necessary step for Baldwin. So we're just now starting talks with Baldwin and getting this moving and building capacity behind marrying peer support and resource navigation and figuring out how to move forward in the best way. I think what we thought was important um, to bring to you all today is we, of course, want to let you answer and want to answer any questions you have, but um, it's important that this is the, this is one time funding that the county is bringing to the table. Um, the project team is working hard to um, leverage ongoing resources for this program. Um, I think there's a hope that there there is a role for county funding in the long term in some way, shape, or form. But we do need to leverage the other partners in our community. Um, so conversations with the cities of Eudora and Baldwin. Um, I do think it's important to note, you know, that the um, Eudora uh, Library is invested in this. They've designed a space in their new facility for the program. Um, but we will be having conversations with the cities of Baldwin. Um, I think that the United Way sees the Navigator program as a core program moving forward um, and really doubling down on this that program and how we leverage 211. Um, those are some of the other projects that we were working on as a project team. Um, but really just wanting to acknowledge that um, the county's funding this year, it's one time, but we wanna just make sure that we're letting you all know that we are gonna be committed to trying to find the ongoing sustainable resources to sustain the program, um, but also build up a record of hopeful success um, and to document the need for this work in Eudora, but also countywide. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Mary. Um, and Carol, I see your name up there too. So thanks for joining us. Um, it's Commissioner Reed, I, um, well, I'm really excited about this. <laughs> I'm trying to articulate the, the question that I have. Do you have any sense in your conversation so far about um, the number of people that you think it would take to, um, sustain this throughout uh, throughout the community at all three at three um, city libraries we talked about those numbers at all beyond this kind of getting it off the ground and um, doing some of that development work I think some of the outcomes that I know Mary has set out um, for this program and the, the, the that we're going to track should reflect that to try to document the need and the number of hours but I think the good news is also that, you know, like I mentioned the, the community navigator, the existing community navigator program that United Way has, um, how are we, so we're gonna be thinking hard about, you know, how do we not duplicate any efforts, but how are we connecting to existing resources to have a, um, a robust referral countywide system. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna doc, try to document and make and document that need um, so that we can make that case. Um, we probably do need more than um, than one person, but I think um, the additional peer that's going to be working um, with Mary um, that's outlined in this agreement I think is a great sustainability model here. Um, I think that the uh, United Way's um, support for the AmeriCorps program will continue to be um, a great asset to how that what this program looks like in the future as well but we can make sure that we're documenting that i think Bob, also that. yeah i think there's opportunity commissioner reed um you know we've learned some things through covid when the lawrence public library closed and then when it reopened and there was sort of limited access we're being forced to learn some things we had three peer fellows at the library at the time so they, they were providing about 45 hours a week of coverage, and that was a lot of contact time. When the library went offline, we went online, and people had the ability to schedule appointments 
with peers virtually. Um, we were doing that kind of as a immediate response to the challenges of COVID. But I think one of the things we learned was the concept not only had merit, but it had, but it had traction. So if you think about it, I think if we have, you know, multiple peers over time who are in library settings. Um, and we shift away from some of the investment we've made, for example, in the emergency department and start to pull that capacity more out into the community that they're, you know, with Mary's leadership, with United Way on board in this partnership, and with these, these libraries sort of saying we want to do this, I think there's a different type of energy now than there was even a year and a half ago um, to, you know, kind of really put a system together here and it would take a while um, and it would require patience and some more you know sustained investment but i think we can do a lot of that capacity in terms of placing peers in libraries with what we're doing with the peer fellows project we have funding for 12 peers in that project and um, you know we've been moving people from one space to another and as we've done that we've asked the community partner you know, you create a job, it's a workforce development program, you create a job, and one of our peer fellows will transition into that job. We've had some good success with that. We've had challenges in other places. It hasn't been 100% home run. Um, but out of the 20, 23 peers that have participated in the program, um, 13 have completed a year or more. And of the 13 that have completed a year or more, 10 of those individuals have transitioned into full-time jobs. So they've gone from part-time work in the peer fellows program and training to full-time jobs in our community. And um, so I think the concept has, has merit. And if we keep trying to push the concept, um, we're going to get where we need to be, which is to have peers in settings that they did not exist um, years ago three years ago. I don't know, does that answer the question, Commissioner Reed? It totally does. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, questions from fellow commissioners? Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and open this up for public comment. Is there anyone, it doesn't look like there's anyone here with their hand up for public comment in person. How about online, Jill? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring this back um, for a bit more discussion. I will, I will just reiterate that I'm really excited to see this and I'm um, extremely grateful on behalf of our community for the work that has gone in in these past several months, a year or more of um, problem solving and figuring out how we can gradually build a system, like you say, Bob, that is really truly community-wide um, and done with intention. Um, and I know, you know, this, I think this conversation that we had last year, last summer and last fall around the request for Eudora resource um, navigation in specific was a really compelling request to me. Um, and Mary, you're to thank for a lot of that. I mean, you have um, the kind of work that you've done and the way you've showed up to do the work even before having the training as a peer fellow, um, but realizing that those are the skills that you were uh, learning on your own and figuring out, um, which I really respect and appreciate. You, that had a tremendous impact on the community of Eudora and Eudora members, uh, residents speak highly about that um, all the time and about the programs that are grown out of that. And so I think that that, I just wanna, bring that up because I think it highlights the power of the potential of this kind of work. Um, and, you know, I really, really like the peer model for, for the reasons that um, you've talked about, Bob, with the workforce development and that kind of opportunity to, um, to gradually move folks into uh, good work experiences that are sustainable for them. Um, that's great. And it's also just a proven concept that to meet people where they're at, both physically and mentally and emotionally, um, and, and show up um, as a peer rather than perhaps a case manager or um, a social worker or some of those other um, helping professions that we have, which are important and have immense value um, and are not always what somebody needs 
to just get the resources and the kind of connecting of the dots um, that will help them substantially. So I just am really excited about that model. Um, and it's a way to both empower those peer fellows that are doing the work um, to really make an impact on their community and build the life they want for themselves and the kind of figure out what kind of work they want to do. But it also inherently empowers the community members that are showing up at the library, um, at the different libraries in our community and seeking that kind of resource. So I'm, I'm just really excited about it. Um, Carol, I, I see that you've turned your camera on. So I really appreciate all of the um, investment of time and dedication that Eudora Library has shown. Um, that's really huge. And I, Lawrence Public Library is not with us tonight, but we know that that's the, um, the kind of model of work and the way that they have created their physical space and the way that they respond to the community's reliance. Um, and I think that's been powerful. And it, it, I'm excited to see that same kind of energy grow and really happy to hear that conversations have started with Baldwin too and that they're eager about it. So um, anyway, that's my, my long-winded thank you to all of you. I'm, uh, I appreciate the time and effort and that this is sort of some creative, um, creative problem solving right now to kind of get us to a space where we can figure out what makes sense to sustain that work. This is Commissioner Portillo. I would like to make a motion to authorize the county administrator to sign a service agreement with the United Way of Douglas County and Eudora Library to provide one-time funding from the FY 2022 Peer Fellows Program budget to support the Community Navigator Project. So I would like to make a comment and then I'll second. I, I would say, um, first of all, this is a really creative situation, a creative solution to what came to us in this summer. and. Um, that's exciting to me. It's exciting to, to hear how you thought about um, what's maybe another way we could go about it. Sometimes the best innovation comes from, from disappointment, <laughs> you know, and how do we look at this differently? And, and uh, Bob, just I think the peer model is such a powerful model. And we've heard from community members in our outline, in our, in our municipalities in Eudora and Baldwin and and uh, LeCompton, you know, I want to be able to access services in my community and using the library is such a brilliant way of doing that. Um, and I hope we can uh, continue to partner with, with Baldwin and, and Eudora and, and find a way in LeCompton as well to, to kind of bring services there. And the peer model just is, it's a pretty exciting way to do that. Um, that, that doesn't need a big footprint, but can still provide some of those services. So. Um, just, I just want to echo some of Commissioner Reed's comments and, and I'll go ahead and second the motion. Great. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. And Mandy um, from, from United Way, I see that you're here too. So thank you for um, sitting with us this evening and for United Way's work on this creative solution. We appreciate it. Okay, with that, we'll move on to appointments. Do we have any to discuss for this evening? Okay. Okay. Seeing that's what I thought. Um, seeing none, we'll move on to miscellaneous. Commissioners, you have my memo in the pack. I just want to point out that next week we also have a four o'clock session, as we talked about earlier on uh, the certified community behavioral health center model. So uh, just stand for any questions you all have. Commissioner Reed, I don't have any questions. I don't have any miscellaneous items to add. How about? fellow commissioners. Okay, seeing none, I believe that brings us to the end of our meeting and we are adjourned. <laughs>